Now let me uh, turn the microphone over to Professor Lawrence Tribe, the Ralph S. Tyler Jr. Professor of Constitutional Law here at the Harvard Law School, who will introduce our evening's guest. Thank you. Thank you very much. The pleasure and the privilege of introducing a speaker doesn't depend on agreeing with what he's likely to say. And I think it will come as no secret that Reverend Jerry Falwell and I are adversaries on a number of vital public issues, such as the President's proposed voluntary prayer amendment, the proposed overruling of Roe versus Wade by one of a number of human life amendments, uh, and at a more general level, the proper relationship between religion and politics in a pluralistic republic. As I hope this forum will make very plain, there really is no dispute here about whether Reverend Falwell or other religious leaders are entitled to speak their minds on these politically charged matters. I would very strongly defend their right, Reverend Falwell's right, to be heard just as strongly I would argue that much of what he says is wrong, and he will, I'm sure, say equally kind things about me. Uh, there is no doubt, though, that Reverend Falwell is one of the nation's most influential voices on these vital matters. One symptom of the sway he is able to exert is the growth of the Thomas Road Baptist Church, which he founded in Lynchburg, Virginia. Its growth from 35 members in 1956 to 21,000 members today, making it the nation's second largest church. Other symptoms include the five million strong membership of the moral majority, the fact that his gospel hour reaches as many North American radio and TV outlets as any program in the United States, the various successes of Liberty Baptist College and Liberty Baptist Seminary, both founded and led by Reverend Falwell, and a number of honors that he's received. Religious Heritage of America named him Clergyman of the Year in 1979. Two years later, as an index of views that many people hold about him, U.S. News and World Report called him one of the 25 most influential people in the United States. Last year, an annual poll conducted by Good Housekeeping ranked him the second most influential man in the United States of America. Uh, he has written five books and he edits two monthly journals, and last but not least, and not without help from several Roman Catholic archbishops, he has lent spiritual authority to what I would describe as the Reagan administration's claim to serve from a heavenly pulpit. <laughs> Twenty-four years and one week ago tonight, John F. Kennedy gave a now historic address about the relationship between religion and politics to the Greater Houston Ministerial Association. Reacting to charges that if he were elected president, he would be a vehicle for the Vatican's views, John Kennedy expressed his opposition to making any presidency an instrument of any religious group. Now, there are moments when Reverend Falwell seems to echo that very sentiment. Although his benediction of the Republican convention in Dallas, when, as I understand it, he called President Reagan and Vice President Bush God's chosen instruments for rebuilding America, and I quote, struck few observers as one of those moments. <laughs> Reverend Falwell's explanation when he and I appeared opposite one another on Face the Nation recently uh, was the same as the one that he gave in the Wilmington, Delaware News last March 15, 1983. He said, and I quote, every person who rules was given the power to rule by God. So the person who is against the government is really against something that God has commanded. I wonder, I wonder, could that have been said of the anti-slavery evangelists of the 1800s who were against what government was doing, of Martin Luther King Jr. and the freedom writing ministers, and of the anti-war clergy like William Sloan Coffin in the 1960s? I wonder if it can be said of fundamentalist ministers and Catholic priests who oppose pro-choice government actions in the 1980s. Could it have been said of Moses' opposition to Pharaoh or of Christ's opposition to Caesar? The prophetic and critical role of religion, in my view, may be fatally compromised when church and state embrace each other too tightly. 
the ability of each of us to express dissent may be jeopardized when people come to think that resisting government entails defying the Almighty. So when Reverend Falwell writes in the Wilmington, Delaware News, March 15, 1983, that, and I quote, a young man who refuses to register for the draft is disobeying the scripture. Or when he writes in his 1980 book, Listen America, that God will not honor and bless our nation unless we support government control over reproduction and, quote, take a stand against abortion, unquote, I feel a sense of dismay. And I ask myself, could it be the same Reverend Falwell who wrote in 1981 in his book, The Fundamentalist Phenomenon, that, and I quote, moral majority strongly supports a pluralistic America and is committed to the separation of church and state. Now, in part, as I understand it, such separation was designed to replace Europe's religious wars with what the Constitution's preamble calls domestic tranquility. So I'm reassured when I read in Reverend Falwell's 1980 book, we have no hit list. But I ask myself, could that be the Reverend Falwell, who in a September 8th newsletter last year, September 8, 1983, said, and I quote, the nuclear freeze movement must be stopped dead in its tracks. The Soviet sympathizers, the liberal clergymen, the Jane Fondas must be exposed for what they are. <laughs> Now, that sort of what I would honestly call odd feminine scapegoating troubles me, and I am troubled, and I hope to learn more about what was meant by what Reverend Falwell said on Bill Moyer's journal, September 28, 1980, and I quote, <laughs> We need to return to the McCarthy era when we registered all communists. <laughs> well, I, Reverend Falwell says that is a misquote, and I, I hope it is. But then I ask, could that be the same Reverend Falwell? <laughs> no, you should hear this because much of it expresses a tolerant and open-minded view. The same Reverend Falwell who wrote in his 1981 book, all too often, I'm quoting, we conservatives take our preferences and preach them as if it were the gospel itself. And I would say all too often we liberals do as well. Now that seems to me a more tolerant and reflective observation than one that I believe Reverend Falwell made in his 1980 book. The free enterprise system, and I quote, is clearly outlined in the book of Proverbs in the Bible. <laughs> I think you, you get my drift. Most basic... <laughs> Most basic of all, and the reason I hope we will listen attentively and respectfully to what Reverend Falwell has to say. Most basic of all is the recognition that our political battles, whether over weapons policy or over sexual identity or over reproductive freedom, are not, to quote Senator Kennedy's address this September 10, an arena of combat between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And I think that that remains true whomever one would identify as on the side of light, and whomever one would view as on the side of darkness. Reverend Falwell sounded a similarly open-minded note in his book, The Fundamentalist Phenomenon, when he wrote in 1981, we do not believe that those who disagree with moral majority belong to an immoral minority. And yet it was Reverend Falwell who wrote in his 1980 book, we cannot allow an immoral minority of our population to intimidate us on moral issues. So tonight, all of us who are perplexed or who care deeply about what this influential and accomplished minister is telling his followers and means to tell them in the months and years ahead, have the opportunity to hear directly from the real Reverend Falwell. So I present him to you now. Will the real Reverend Jerry Falwell please stand up? Thank you, Professor Tribe, for that brief and unbiased introduction. <laughs> and as I have coffee at your house tonight, tea at your house after 
the program this evening, we shall recount that. <laughs> well, it's good to be back in Reagan country. <clears throat> we, uh... I read the polls. I was in L.A. yesterday, and I read the polls of Massachusetts, where Mr. Reagan's ahead by four points. And uh, we congratulate you on, on the correctness of your position. I was assigned a topic, religion and politics. I would like to begin by making a statement and then attempting to substantiate it in the address. And I will, in 30 or 35 minutes, about the length of the introduction, be finished. <laughs> and at that time, at that time, you may have all the time that the forum wishes for you to ask anything you want, and I will do my best to answer you, and if I cannot, I'm sure Professor Tribe can. <laughs> now, we, um, the statement is this. The statement is that the religion and politics debate that is such a furor in the, in the national media today is in reality a non-issue. I do not believe that anything is occurring at this time that has not for 200 years been occurring in this country. From the time of the black militia, and the days when we won our independence from Great Britain, uh, to a great degree, uh, situations occurring and being initiated in church buildings like Bruton Parish, or during those days that Dr. Tribe mentioned in the uh, abolitionist movement when Charles Finney, an evangelical, and many others led the move that broke the back of slavery in this country. Or in those days when uh, we were fighting for the civil rights of minority Americans, ministers, not just Dr. Martin Luther King, but many others, uh, were in the forefront. Or during Vietnam War days when William Sloan Coffin, at one of your uh, subsidiaries, Yale, uh, <laughs> was uh, suggesting to young men to burn their draft cards. Or more recently, when Reverend Jesse Jackson was running for the presidency of the United States and who did not lead a prayer benediction at the Democratic Convention, but rather brought a major primetime address. It is amazing to me that the same persons who are yelling bloody murder because of Archbishop Bernard Law or Archbishop John O'Connor or Kelly or Malone or uh, practical nurse Jerry Falwell speaks out on social issues suddenly we're violating the principle of the separation of church and state and we're committing a heinous constitutional crime. I think it is all crass hypocrisy, it is sour grapes, and there is absolutely a non-issue created by Mr. Mondale and others at a time when the president has an invulnerability about him that, uh, that uh, challenges anyone's uh, breaking through uh, that invincible record that he has set up, which will, in my opinion, November 6, bring him to uh, the most uh, tremendous presidential victory in history, including the Goldwater-Johnson uh, race. I believe that in, on November 7th, when you read the newspapers, the American people will have caused this debate to accrue to the benefit of Ronald Reagan and not Walter Mondale. Now, I, read, I wrote an article for Newsweek that's out this week or last week, I wrote 700 words. They wanted 500. I tried to slip in a couple hundred extra, but this is what I wrote. 500 got in, and it pretty well states my position on the religion politics issue. Quote, mixing religion and politics can mean many different things. It could mean that one advocates a theocratic state. I certainly do not. Such a merger of religion and politics is as far removed from my position as is its opposite, namely a political system like communism which represses religious thought and expression at every level of society. I firmly believe it is a religious duty to be a good citizen, and that it is one's duty as a good citizen to participate in politics. But I can be true neither to my country nor my God if I separate my religious convictions from my political views. If I am to be whole, to be one with myself and with God, I must infuse my life as a political being with beliefs I learned from the div divine being. This is not radical, fundamentalist Christian theory. It is the basic belief which first drove the pilgrims to our shores and later inspired the founding fathers to proclaim our independence from Britain, quote, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, end of quote. It is the notion which infused the anti-slavery movement of the 19th century 
And it is the spirit with which the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. took his message of racial harmony and equality from the pulpit to the streets. Why should we not permit moral values to influence our thinking about important contemporary issues? To say that spiritual values and morality are at the heart of our society is not to establish a state religion. Far from it. It is only to say with the Constitution that we guarantee the fundamental right of free exercise for all religions throughout our society. Yet recently, the Connecticut Supreme Court struck down a law which sought to protect the right of employees to observe their chosen Sabbath day. The court held the law unconstitutional under the Establishment Clause. Surely this represents a misinterpretation of the constitutional rule against the establishment of religion, and at the same time a move away from the First Amendment's guarantee of the free exercise of religion. Furthermore, the moral values of the Judeo-Christian tradition which have inspired and elevated American democracy from the beginning must not be denied expression in the exercise of our democratic rights. The greatness of our political system is that it not only guarantees us freedom of conscience, but also permits us to vote our conscience. When pro-choice groups urge congressmen to support federal funding for abortions and theologians urge a nuclear freeze, they are exercising their democratic rights. How can it be then that when others like myself support candidates who advocate the protection of unborn children or voluntary prayer in our public schools, we are ostracized as un-American or worse. When those calling themselves liberals register new voters, they're said to enlarge the, the democratic process. Yet when I and my compatriots urge fellow believers to vote, we're condemned for mixing church and state. You cannot have it both ways, not if you want to be intellectually honest. My position, and I believe it is the position of a majority of Americans today, just as it has been for 200 years is that it is not only legitimate to advocate basic religious values in the political arena, but it is absolutely essential for the health of our republic that believers participate in the political debate of our day. To suggest otherwise is to deny our heritage and to subject future generations of Americans to a society less free and less tolerant than the one our parents bequeathed to us. The question today is, why is there such an outcry? I repeat, there was little outcry of any in all the other instances that I have mentioned. But immediately, Mr. Cuomo, Mr. Ferraro, Mr. Mondale, and many others are incensed when Archbishop O'Connor, or Archbishop Law, makes a statement that to say I am personally opposed to abortion, but is as ridiculous as saying 150 years ago I am as personally opposed I am personally opposed to slavery, but if my neighbor wants one or two, that is his business. I agree with those archbishops, and I agree with their right to speak out and to speak out consistently and often, even as Pope John Paul II, one of the great, great leaders of our world today, when he in Canada yesterday in his parting shot before returning home declared that abortion is the, is the international crime of today's society. I agree with him. And yet to say that we who believe those views and values are wrong, to say to our people everywhere that you should be looking for candidates, men, women, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, who espouse those same commitments to the dignity of human life, born and unborn, to say that that is a violation of an alleged uh, wall of separation, constitutional wall between church and state, to me is very, very hypocritical unless, and I think Professor Tribe would certainly land in this position in all fairness, unless you also contested the right of the liberal church to do the same. I think you have done that. Most of our critics have not done that. Most of our critics have said you have no right to enter in the debate while to William Sloan Coffin or the Berrigan brothers no such thing was ever said. Now it is my belief that what is good for the liberal goose is good for the conservative gander. I do not think for a moment that the framers of the First Amendment had in mind uh, a wall of separation between church and state. I do believe that that particular amendment was intended to keep government off the back of the church because they said clearly Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a state church, a church. God knows we want no state church, whether it be Roman Catholic or Baptist or Anglican. It was that Church of England and other state churches that brought 
uh, the founding fathers to our shores. And the other clause simply says that Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion, which means nothing more than that Congress shall never tell us how or when or where to worship, as in the Connecticut, uh, the Connecticut case I addressed in the Newsweek article. And that simply means that if Pentecostals want to jump over the pews and Baptists sleep in them, it's none of Congress' business. Now that is all the First Amendment says, and it is intended to keep government off our backs. Churches are people. And a great majority of the American people belong to somebody's church or synagogue. And to tell religious Americans, I'm not speaking now of the, of the ecclesiastical body. I agree with the Pope and with all others who have addressed this, that no officialdom representing churches should do as the World Council of Churches does, or as the National Council of Churches does, and say, on behalf of our X number of million parishioners, Vote for John Doe. That is wrong. That is a violation. It is an abuse of our powers. But to say to a minister, a tax-paying minister, and that is what I am, by the way, that you have no right to endorse Ronald Reagan brings a very profound baloney from the one who's doing the endorsing. Because I feel that it has been that plague of do-nothingism among the conservative religious people of this country that has produced much of the problems that we're crying out against today. For example, Edmund Burke said, all that's necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. I preached because it was taught to me in seminary. I preached that ministers ought to preach and pray and lead people to Christ and should never address moral and social issues or get involved in the political arena because the verse had been quoted to me, religion and politics don't mix. It's like that verse, God helps those who help themselves. They both sound very poetic, neither one in the Bible. God helps those who cannot help themselves and who turn to him for help. And likewise, there is nothing, there's no difference between the sacred and the secular for a believer. All is sacred. My responsibility as a churchman that's sacred. My responsibility as a citizen, as a parent, that also is sacred. And our Lord said we have a dual obligation, one, to render unto God that which is God's. And that is what I do with a 21,000 church member, uh, membership church where five times on Sunday with 4,000 adults present each time, I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel of Ronald Reagan. That is why when I come to Georgetown University, as I did Tuesday night or Harvard tonight, and I'm asked to speak on, on religion and politics, I, I, I preach on the gospel of American politics because I feel I have an obligation when I'm asked to bring an address on a particular subject not to abuse my rights and make this a preachment of the Christian gospel instead. And as we render to God that which is God's and to Caesar, government, that which is Caesar's, we provide that light and salt ministry which makes the church to be effective and to become the conscience of the society in which it exists. What was it that caused the conservative church to come out of that? You know, I printed a sermon once on ministers and marches back in the 60s, or early 60s, urging our preachers, stay in the pulpits now, you can trust government to correct its own ills. I tried to buy back every copy <laughs> unsuccessfully. Because the fact is, after Roe v. Wade and after so many other moral cancers that began to corrupt our society, the drug epidemic not being one of the least of them, destroying the minds and bodies of our young people, the pornographic explosion demeaning our women and, and destroying the value system of our, our young people, many other problems, a 40% divorce rate, it became very obvious to me and to many religious and conservative Jews and Catholics and Protestants and Mormons, etc., that we had to somehow put together a coalition, a political coalition, to address from the conservative perspective what the World Council of Churches and its American counterpart, the National Council of Churches, and such liberal spokesmen are addressing from the left. We were not against their addressing the issues, but we had allowed them to become the sole spokesman for moral uh, principles in this our society and we had lost by default we didn't show up we thought politics is dirty business 
and you'll somehow you'll hurt your relationship with God and you'll dirty up and blemish Christianity and Judaism if, if in fact you get out of the arena. The day came when in my heart I decided I'm one person, but I will do what one can do. And I found a few Jewish rabbis and Catholic priests who said, yes, I feel the same way. And we formed in 1979, June, in Washington, D.C., the moral majority with a handful of people, which has grown now to over 100,000 priests and rabbis and pastors and blacks and whites and young and old and all kinds. Catholics are the largest part of the constituency, 30%, because of our strong pro-life uh, emphasis. But conservative Protestants, evangelicals, fundamentalists, Mormons, conservative and orthodox Jews, many, many Americans who have very little, if any, theological affinity have joined together on the basis of several issues. Number one, the pro-life position. I, for one, have advocated legislation that would, that would stop abortion except in cases where the life of the mother is endangered, rape and incest. Now, my Christian ideal is that the life of the mother is a self-defense issue and, in fact, is a valid case for abortion. And my personal biblical position is that in cases of rape and incest, that we do as we are doing in Lynchburg with our Save a Baby ministry, we take that little 14-year-old uh, girl in who was raped by her father and help her through that pregnancy and love her and pay all of her bills and educate her. And as an adoption agency, which we are, and we've started 183 such centers in the last 35 months, place that little baby in the arms of a loving Christian and stable family and nurse that young lady back to health so that later at age 20 or 25 she doesn't look back on that abortion and have a problem with her own conscience in the taking of human life. At the same time, I do not believe that is winnable legislation, and I believe in a pluralistic society, and many of my Catholic friends disagree with us on this, but I think we're slowly coming to a consensus. It is better to prevent the... the Convenience abortions, over 90% of all performed, about 1.4 million plus of the 1.5 million uh, performed annually, than to, in a very stubborn way, to say we'll save them all or none, which has been the unreasonable pro-life emphasis in times past. It is, un I think, unwinnable legislation unless we have at least those three exceptions. And slowly we're coming to that consensus. Uh, we also took a second position. This was 1979, and we've never proliferated. We agreed we would not add issues so that we could stay together and agree. That was a pro-traditional family issue, and we defined the family in the Judeo-Christian tradition of that being a legally married husband-wife relationship. And with a 40% divorce rate, felt that a great deal was needed to re-establish the sanctity of the home as the basic, uh, the basic element of a civilized society. A third position we took was a pro-moral position, namely a commitment to, uh, the, to attack the drug, the illegal drug traffic in this country tenaciously, legislatively, every way possible, and secondly, to oppose pornography as demeaning to the women of our nation and injurious to the moral fiber and fabric of our young people. And a fourth position, uh, which has an addendum to it, a support for strong national defense, and a year later, as Ronald Reagan became the candidate for presidency, his Peace Through Strength initiative pretty well personified our stance on uh, strong national defense, not superiority, but parity, as the best uh, deterrent against war, and with it, the addendum, support for the state of Israel and for Jewish people everywhere. Now, that was and is the foundation of moral majority, and the reason why it's grown so rapidly and you'll find in this political coalition a great number of persons who have little in common religiously, who have agreed to fight together now so we can fight each other later, who have agreed to disagree on theology, but as Americans to fight together. You know, the liberals learned that a long time ago. They shoot it out all year, but on election day, they're always smart enough to put their gang together and whip us. We conservatives have been very talented at shooting our own wounded. If we don't agree on everything, We'll have war. I'm glad to say the conservative move in this country is coming of age. We're not there yet, but we're coming of age so that Catholics and Protestants and Jews and Mormons, Americans in general, who agree on a shared moral uh, basis, tenets of values, can join hands together to, yes, vote for 
candidates, regardless of their political uh, party membership, candidates who are closest to the views and values they espouse. Now, there's very little different in what we're doing than what the labor unions have always done. That is the way labor unions support candidates and oppose candidates, on those candidates closest to their views and values. That is how NOW selects candidates and puts together their hit list professor and goes after this incumbent and that incumbent on the basis of a shared views and values. That is exactly, I would suggest, how everybody in this room votes. There are no ideal candidates. I don't know of any candidate who perfectly personifies everything I believe in. I doubt if you know one who is a perfect personification of all you believe in. But you vote for the person who is closest to that. At least I hope you do. One thing that I have noticed in America that I think is healthy, and that is in the conservative religious movement, that sleeping giant that began to awaken in 1980 and is standing up full grown in 1984, having through our organization registered five million new voters the last five years and as a part of the American Coalition for Traditional Values will register another two and a half, maybe three million this year. The thing that I have noticed is most of them, like the cross-section of this country, are registered Democrats. But they have little or no party loyalty. They vote for the individual who is closest to what they believe in. And as far as I'm concerned, the future of our country rest in our ability to sift out and sort out the individual, the person, who in fact does resemble best what we believe in and work for that candidacy. Now, 1975, 76, when we first began going out there and conducting rallies and putting preachers together long before the formation of the moral majority, people were saying, yes, I agree with that, and yes, I think that is nice, but we could get most of them in a phone booth who were really willing to become activists and do something. By 1980, that had changed, and there was an activism, and there was, uh, in some areas, a person standing up here and there and so on. And uh, we, however, had to go out and, in 1976, convince our people uh, when Election Day was. In 1980, we had to convince them it wasn't a send to vote. In 1984, we have 102,000 churches across America, 102,000 in the coalition who are registering voters, for the main part, in their lobbies every Sunday. Not telling their people for whom to vote, but telling them as good citizens, you ought to be a registered, informed voter. And the result is that millions of new entries to the political scene are coming in and will in November for the first time pull a lever and vote for local and state and national candidates. I cannot help but think that that is good. I mentioned the theocracy in the Newsweek article. I don't know of anyone who in his real rational moments believes that there's anybody, any responsible leader in this country who wants that. I cannot believe that there's anybody here today who feels that we ought to have a state church. I know the president doesn't believe that. I know he has clearly and openly and often made that plain and clear. And as one of your writers here said recently, if he established a state church, he'd have to attend one. <laughs> I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody here is trying to impose his religious values over upon all others. But the question is, what about the legislation of morality? And most often, the issue is abortion. Would it not be the legislation of the morality of the Catholic Church or the Evangelical Church or whatever upon the populace, in fact, to defend the unborn through some kind of judicial or legislative action that protects at least the, the, from the convenience abortions? I would say to you, and Professor Tribe would know this far better than I, that all of civilized society is based upon the legislation of morality by consensus. That is why you cannot take someone's life with impunity. You can be sure of the fact that way back there, some fellows got together and decided this is a good rule to legislate morality on. Thou shall not kill. And rape and bank robbery. And so all of the, the, the structure of our, even the speed limits on the highway, somebody decided to legislate that morality for the sake of our welfare. And those are the words, the general welfare. 
You don't always have to have a majority agreeing, by the way, when you get consensus, because you'll recall in 19, 1950s and following when the civil rights battle was waged, I grew up in the South. I grew up in Virginia. As a matter of fact, Lynchburg, Virginia. I've spent all 51 years of my life there, except in days when I was away from in college. I was raised a segregationist. I, didn't, I wasn't raised a Christian. I didn't own a Bible until I was in my second year of college. My father was an agnostic, his father before him an atheist. My father was in the oil business. He was good at making money. But he did not know the Lord, and he had no spiritual values. And it was not until my second year of college, when I was trying to decide between journalism and mechanical engineering, and both because neither required public speaking, <laughs> I, uh, I heard a radio broadcast, and I heard Dr. Charles E. Fuller on Sunday mornings. My mother was a godly woman. My father would not allow her to make us go to church, and so she'd go out and very wise leave the radio on, knowing no one would get up on Sunday mornings to cut it off. And I heard the gospel and the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And, and I, through hearing the gospel by radio, became a born-again Christian and then purchased my first Bible. I didn't, uh, I didn't own a Bible. I didn't know a verse of Scripture in the Bible. And so for me, it was, uh, it was necessary as an adult to completely change directions. Two months after my conversion to Christ, I felt the call to the ministry. And that was 32 years ago, a little more than that. Nothing's been the same since. But in my own life, it has not been uh, bad for me that I've lived in a society uh, where human rights were guaranteed. It's been good for me because as a segregationist who believed that it was spiritual, and I wasn't even so sure about separate but equal. The equal part didn't interest me too much. Most of my contemporaries who grew up in the South with me have forgotten that conveniently. But I remember myself as a segregationist. As a matter of fact, after I became a Christian and had finished Bible college and had started a church in Lynchburg, Virginia in 1956, it was five years before I baptized a black person. And it was through a personal examination of my own life and the scriptures and experience in the ministry that I became convinced Segregation is morally wrong. And when I baptized the first black person in the, in the baptistry, Thomas Road Baptist Church, I told him, you and I neither may come up alive out of this water. And I wasn't sure but what that was the case. I figured some deacon will pick us off from the balcony. We survived it, and we've baptized hundreds since then. But thank God, while the Jerry Falwells and thousands like me all over America, north and south, were not involved and were somewhat prejudiced against the civil rights movement. There were some preachers out there like Martin Luther King Jr. who could care less whether it was popular. In their hearts, they believed it was right, and they fought it through to the bitter end. Now, everybody looks back and cheers, hey, isn't that wonderful now? But not everybody was cheering then when they were killing the civil rights workers. And Martin Luther King himself and today, I want to tell you that the, that the battle for the unborn is just as important. We have a voiceless, defenseless uh, minority of unborn babies who cannot speak for themselves. And I say we mustn't condemn, we must congratulate the archbishops of the Roman Catholic Church and the hundreds of non-Catholic ministers across this country and the Orthodox rabbis and lay people by the millions who are standing up and saying, we may not have a consensus, and they may call it uh, the legislation of morality, and they may call us every kind of bad name they wish, but it's right, and we're going to see it through. Now, that is what the civil rights movement is all about today. It is not legislating morality or the unconstitutional mixing of religion and politics. It is a battle for the civil rights of a disenfranchised minority, namely the unborn. Now, the end is not there. When a child is born, our people have been properly condemned for, for wanting to bring into the world one and a half million new babies a year and then let them starve to death or put them in homes where they're not wanted or where they'll get something less than loving treatment. That's a proper criticism. And I, have, I, I agree with what Fulton Sheen said 25 years ago. No minister has the right to point to a little girl and say, you cannot have an abortion. Unless, when she asks the question, and who is going to help me have this baby? Who's going to educate me? Who's going to house and care and love me? And who is going to raise my baby? The church says, we will. 
Now, that is what has got to be done in this country, not just the cursing of the darkness. We've got to build hundreds, if not thousands, of crisis pregnancy centers and, uh, and maternity homes and develop ad adoption agencies. There were five million requests for babies to adopt last year that were unfulfilled. Five million families appeal for little babies to adopt, children, f families that cannot have children for the main part. One and a half million died by abortion. Obviously, there is a demand for babies. In vitro fertilization in, and genetic engineering, etc. I'm not here to condemn that. I'm here simply to say that it is biological holocaust to destroy little human beings when there's so many loving families that like, would like to have them. But the church must provide the means so that we have our doors and hearts and our pocketbooks open so that any little girl without a dollar can walk in. We've had the privilege of working with 9,000 such girls, most of them unwed teenage girls, high school girls. We've had the privilege of working with 9,000 of them in the last 35 months and creating 183 such centers, and our goal is to create 1,000 centers total in the next three to five years. I believe it can be done. I don't think that is legislating morality, nor do I think it is the unconstitutional mixing of church and state. May I conclude by saying that we did not make the moral issues political. The Supreme Court did. But the Supreme Court ruled uh, abortion legal, abortion on demand legal, they made it a political issue. We did not make the moral issues of pornography political issues. But when the courts, by their inaction or their misdeeds, allowed the Hugh Hefners and the Bob Guccione's and the Larry Flint's and the other porn kings to create a $10 billion legal industry to the total disregard of the American woman and the American child, they made it a political issue. And the question is, do we stay outside or do we ignore that alleged wall and crawl over it because we still believe it to be moral and do something about it? We've chosen the latter. Beaming people now. As I said, the microphones are here. We'd like you to make your questions short so that lots of people have the opportunity to speak. And if you feel your personal compulsion to follow up your question, would you please get to the back of the line so we just keep things moving? And that's no problem. Uh, no speeches, exactly. Why don't we start over here on the right? I'm bothered by the fact that you put so much emphasis on the civil rights movement and try to use it as a justification for the movement with the conservative churches right now. I'm a Baptist preacher myself, and I was involved in the streets in Birmingham, Alabama at the time of, of Martin Luther King and, and all of that movement. And I saw with my own eyes many people from the conservative white churches that you're talking about are so interested in the rights, much interested in the rights of people in the streets, beating and killing and doing up and maiming people every day. And you talk about babies having rights. What about those of us who are alive today and looking at you squarely in the eyes? Where are the rights that we have not yet gotten? Why is our country still dealing with South Africa where apartheid is running wild over there and unfair things are occurring and our corporations and the Reagan administration is not supportive of anything being done about it. I say, Mr. Farwell, that there are some people who are distinctively Christian, but yet disagree with your point of view. Let me ask you a question, if I could. I'll come back. I'll come back. Um, do you... Do you personally... Do you personally approve of, of abortion? I do not personally ap approve of abortion, but I do not. Well, I mean, do you, do you approve? Or do you approve of free choice or the kind of amendment I suggested? Free choice, and I also say. Free choice. I also say that uh, I would like to ask you: Do you approve of what's going on in South Africa? I do not, and I have no problem at all. And most people in this well, room would agree. You, okay. I'm not the president of the United States, by the way, and I'm. Uh, and, but and, and, but but why is not? Why is that not a part of your platform of your organization, the Moral Majority, if you're for... I'll tell you, 
There are many other things not a part of our platform, such as capital punishment, such as domestic policies that are, are legion. We did, we, we made it, I made it very clear we did not create a multi-based uh, platform simply for the sake of getting together a consensus to do the, the things we've accomplished. Now, what I want to say to you is this. You have got to leave room. You mentioned those ministers in, in Birmingham. There are two alternatives. One is to say, let them keep on hating and killing and hurting and uh, continuing their prejudice. Or two, and you're a Baptist minister and should understand this, there should be room for spiritual growth and repentance and forgiveness. And we have in, inside that same church, now I'm not defending every individual there, we have seen a marvelous spiritual transformation. Now, are we glad or do we want to condemn them forever because they've always been racist? I think you and I have the same answer on that. I'm not suggesting that we condemn them forever, but I'm saying put the evidence of your repentance out before. All right, we I'm here it. today and telling if, you. No, but as long as South Africa is the right. way that it is. Let's, let's deal with South the, Africa. In the conservative party, uh, the Republican element, the, the conservative All right. element in the glad to address party that. continue not to come out and speak against us and do nothing in our legislature process against us. And our businesses are still doing business in South Africa, and they are paying white people more wages than they are paying black people. No doubt about I say it. There is something wrong. And of course, let, there is. I say close every embassy that South Africa has in this country. All right, then, I, well, I, since you believe that, then it's fair for me. The reason you're saying that is because, properly so, the whites are discriminating against the blacks and denying them civil rights, correct? That's correct. In the Soviet Union now, taking it a step further, in the Soviet Union, the government is repressing the civil rights of blacks and whites, both, everybody. Now, the question is, should we close down the embassy also in the Soviet Union? I am willing to fight equally as hard in Russia for the rights of people as but should I we am. close Can down the embassy, sir? You made oh, a statement a moment ago. Oh, I want to speak to that, too. Hold on for a minute. Give me okay. a chance. <laughs> when Libya did some things that this country didn't like. We told their people to get out of our country, didn't we? We stopped dialogue with them. So if dialogue is so important, we have not systematically stayed to that particular uh, position along the lines that you're talking now. I think we have deviated that from that quite well, a bit. So I... I know I'm violating your rule by having... I'm bringing the follow-up. I, I invited him back to follow-up. But let me go ahead from there and say what I... It is not as simplistic, sir, as you have put it, to the government tonight because the question we have is what about these pro-Western repressive regimes? We go back a while to Samosa, to the Shah of Iran. We can come to more current days and look at El Salvador. We can look at, as you do, South Africa and other places as well. The question is, they are pro-American. Does that justify their policies? It does not. However, we may look at Samosa and decide, as in Iran, uh, what is the alternative? Is it the Ayatollah? Is it the Sandinistas? Who not only are repressive and have no elections and are treating the people just as badly, if not worse, than before when these repressive right-wingers, pro-Westerners, were there. But the question is this. Are we responsible for making the rest of the world behave and can we be expected to? We should use all the influence we have. And the best influence we have as, is as long as that regime is uh, friendly to us, and we are putting dollars there, we can put leverage with it. I suggest we have no leverage in Iran tonight. We have no leverage in Nicaragua tonight. And it boils down to if I've got to support one skunk or another, I'd prefer the one who's spraying in the other direction. And that is where I stand right now on the Nicaraguan situation and on South Africa. And that's where I stand on El Salvador, that at least, at least we have some hope of changing the direction as long as they are friendly. We have no such leverage in the Soviet Union or any of their satellites. Yes. Uh, Reverend Paulo, my question deals with the issue of prayer in public schools. There are various proposed amendments in Washington now that would allow uh, prayers, spoken Christian prayers in public schools. As a Jew, I am personally opposed to such <laughs> prayer and because I feel that I do not have to follow this prayer if I do not want to, and the answer is that the prayers are called voluntary prayer. And my argument is that I don't see how such prayer can be voluntary in a sense where 
there's a student who's the only Jewish member of his class in the school, and he has a choice to sit through the prayer, which his parents don't want him to and which he does not want to, or to leave and exasperate a problem of discrimination that may already exist. And I'd like to know how you would do that. All right. I would, um... <laughs> I would agree totally that any amendment that would, rec that would rec uh, recommend a Christian prayer or a Jewish prayer or a Muslim prayer or any such mandated prayer is wrong and should not be. The only one in Washington that I support is the President's Amendment, which, uh, if you have read it, has three particular ramifications. One, no child who wishes to pray can be denied that privilege, as is the case today, unless he prays silently. And, 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 and secondly, no child who wishes not to pray uh, may be forced to pray. And number three, no prayer shall be written by any state official which, as I interpret it, includes a school teacher or a school board member or a politician at any level. Now, the President's Amendment, which received a 56-44 positive vote in the Senate, but needed a 67 uh, positive vote to win, that amendment, in my estimate, would take care of that kind of intimidation. There are many who disagree with that, of course, but I suppose an evangelical in Salt Lake City would feel the same way, where that 29 Mormon children offered a prayer and it came to him he also had the right to pray, and during those 29, the right to do homework, look out the window, or whatever. Uh, in my estimate, looking out the window is not harassment or intimidation or not participating. And hearing a prayer, you know, I, um, I can't believe that living in today's world, when you turn on the TV and Billy Graham is there, or when you uh, go to a session of Congress and a different minister leads in prayer, or you go to any civic club and somebody opens with prayer. I cannot believe, as the president said, that any child has ever been injured by exposure to a voluntary prayer. Uh, I do believe that there's been terrible discrimination against the believing children, Jewish and Christian and Muslim and Buddhist and Hindu, in the last 22 years in this country. And I believe that the country, since 22 years ago, has matured and learned a great deal. What uh, the, the, the situation before the Shemp case and other cases that related then that Madeleine O'Hare was involved in, uh, the, the situation was such that what you've just described could happen. That a, an evangelical child could be injured in a Roman Catholic neighborhood, a Jewish child in an evangelical neighborhood, all that did happen. There are many cases where it did happen. I believe the President's Amendment would not give that prerogative, and if it did, there would be immediate court relief. A lot of good people disagree on that. Thank you. Um, Reverend Paul, I stand for you tonight, a Jewish lesbian feminist, so I'm probably opposed to you on almost everything. Um, I would imagine. Um, and I didn't know where to start, but I, I hit on one because it bothered me because I think I have a solution and I'd like to hear your answer. Um, if I am also very pro-choice, um, and all the pro-choice pro people I know, all the organizations, if they had their way, there would never ever need to be an abortion performed in this country ever again, or anywhere else in the world for that matter. And if you want to oppose what you call convenience abortions, why have you not joined with pro-choice forces in America in support of universal, competent sex education in the schools and free, safe, and readily available birth control? I do support sex education. I believe, I believe that sex education as biological science is very healthy and should be a part of education. I do not agree with sex education which in many cases becomes nothing more than academic pornography in the classroom, suggesting, uh, suggesting that certain lifestyles, including homosexuality, are acceptable lifestyles. Now, as a lesbian, you shouldn't be concerned about uh, abortion or pregnancy. I'm concerned about uh, welfare. I'm concerned. I resent that, Reverend Fowell. As a Jew, I am concerned about the welfare of all human beings. And if one human being suffers, it's my responsibility. And I, I would suggest you should have added a phrase there, except for the unborn, right here. I have to apologize. I feel a little bit like a physician confronted with a, a body that's so diseased and corrupted he doesn't know what to treat first. Um, I, 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 my apologies. Who are you talking my, about, them or me? 
uh, oh. any, anyone who will listen, I, I have a feeling I'll get a better audience over here. <laughs> I, I, my apology really is for instead of doing CPR, maybe going for an appendectomy. Uh, I'm as, a minister and, student. Are you a member of the School of Divinity? Excuse no, me. no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a law student. As a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> you sound more like as, a as an educated Jew, I know a lot about the, the Jewish tradition, and as a historian, I know a lot about the Christian tradition. You said something earlier about intellectual honesty. It was a phrase I liked, so I remembered it for this question. It seems to me, as a, as a historian and a Jew, I can't see any connection between the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition. In fact, they've been diametrically opposed on so many of the issues that your group stands for. I was wondering, don't you think it's brainwashing and something like intellectual hypocrisy to use that phrase, Judeo-Christian tradition, as if every Jew and every Christian really did share something fundamental? Uh, well, I think we and, do and share something. You know, I, I'm glad most Jews and Christians disagree with that because uh, most Jews I know are not anti-Christian, nor are most oh, no. uh, Christians anti-Semitic. I think we do share something. We share a common Bible. We share uh, oh, a uh, common uh, Jehovah God. <laughs> we, we share a common Jehovah God. We share a, a, a common love for a single, singular humanity on this earth. I can't imagine what you mean. There's no oneness between Jew and, and Christian. What I mean uh, is by that... By the way, the Christian the... Savior was a Jew. Uh, maybe you didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I know that. I mean, for that matter, for that matter, I could toss judge not that ye be not judged at you over a great many of your positions. I won't do that. Uh, the point is that we are, you're talking about a tradition, a common tradition, which simply doesn't exist. We agree, I think, on some things. Jews agree that Christians shouldn't be persecuted. Christians, some of them agree that Jews shouldn't be persecuted. Um, th there's something like agreement there. But to speak of a common tradition when there isn't any, I think is an attempt to snow the American public and to make them believe that you have a consolidated backing that you really don't have. What's your question? Well, I want to, my, my question, I, I did ask it in, in a question form if you, if you paid attention. <laughs> I was asking simply how you could uphold the idea of a Judeo-Christian tradition as intellect, intellectual honesty. You're first year student, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would, uh... There's, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. My son Jerry nothing. here is a first-year law student also. There's nothing wrong with Everybody has to go through that. Some of my best but may I, but may I say to you that, uh, fortunately, I totally disagree with you that there's no common grounds between the Jew and the Christian. I never And said just that. about everybody I know disagrees with you. I can't imagine anybody else would agree with you. I Mr. Falwell, if you are so pro-life, why don't you start with the living? If you're so pro-life, why don't you start with the 15% of all Americans who live in poverty? And I might add, that's 47% more than when Ronald Reagan took office. If you're so pro-life, how could Dean Wyckoff, one of the moral majority leaders in California, say, and I'm quoting... He was not a moral majority member, but he did say it. Homosexuality is one of those things that should be coupled with murder, and I believe in capital punishment, end quote. Recommending execution for one out of ten Americans does not sound very pro-life to me. Correct. How do you reconcile that with your love for humanity? I have no problem reconciling that since uh, Dean Wyckoff, and this was settled five years ago, we repudiated the gentleman by in public media. I have no idea who he is, never met him, and we repudiated the statement instantly. Back to uh, the other part, the poverty situation. Obviously, you wrote the question out before you heard the speech, because I addressed that issue. We have no right to oppose abortion unless we are willing to do, as Thomas Road Church and thousands of churches do, minister to those in poverty. In Lynchburg, Virginia, for example, there's a family center, and a gentleman who's connected with it is here with me tonight, in the which 1,350 poor families in our city receive their clothing, their food, their professional service, dental, whatever, uh, plumbers and electricians who tithe their time from our church, do their work for them. If there's one hungry person or a child without clothing, adequate clothing, it is simply because they haven't come to us. We do have that obligation. And I would suggest that since that is your deep concern, that you probably spend a great deal of your time in downtown Boston ministering 
to those who are hurting, because it's wrong also to be up here preaching unless you're practicing a sharing of what you have, I, and I assume you do. I tell you, as soon as I get out of this college, I will go to seminary and become a minister. Well, that's you can do it my, while you're here. My wish for you know, you don't have to wait till you're out of doing it. You, as a student, can be down ministering to the poverty people of your town, and I hope you're doing it. I would su suppose that you are. Yeah. <laughs> Reverend Farwell, earlier you mentioned the uh, verse in which Jesus said, Give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and give unto God that which is God's. He interpreted that as being your justification for saying that the church and state should not be separate. Additionally, we can, actually we can reinterpret that, or paraphrase that to say, in some instances one should follow the rule of Caesar's, and in other instances one should follow the rules of God. Earlier you stated that it is pretty much impractical that we could break diplomatic relations with the immoral government of South Africa. By your refusal to repudiate the government of South Africa and to, and to advocate that we should break diplomatic relations with them, are you really following the rule of God or the rule of Caesar? I would, I would say first that the statement, should we obey Caesar when Caesar asks us to do something that is wrong, while I believe that the powers that be are ordained of God, which would include Mr. Chinico and Mr. Castro as well as Mr. Reagan, whether they know it or not, I, I believe that, as Benjamin Franklin put it, and he was a deist himself, that uh, God rules in the affairs of men. Men may not be smart enough to know it, but that is a fact. The God who created the universe does, in fact, uh, he is still a sovereign God. But that does not mean that when government requests that I do something that violates my religious conscience, that I must do it. Uh, it was in the New Testament where the disciples made the statement we ought to obey God rather than men when they were denied the right of worshiping and serving and witnessing for their Savior. When we, like the saints in Russia who are in the gulags now because of their faith, when we are challenged to do something that violates our Christian faith, we have no choice but to disobey Caesar and pay the consequences. Now, I am glad that I, in this country, do not know of any rules or regulations that cause me, in order to obey Caesar, to disobey God. Some would dis, uh, disagree there, saying, well, I have to pay taxes, which supports the federal funding of abortion or a defense establishment or this or that, with which I disagree. And I therefore think that I'm paying taxes uh, against my conscience. I think you have to stretch that a long way. And I, when Professor Tribe mentioned the registration of young men for the draft, you know, in this country, we've always had the right of the conscientious objector. If, for example, you have a personal religious uh, conscience against combat, you can, as always in the past, say so and be put in non-combat duty. My statement then, and I repeat it here, is that there is still no law that requires us to disobey God, even the law of registration, where I can register to vote without going against my conscience against combat, where I don't have to go in combat if that's my conscience. So I do not know of any law in this country today that causes us to disobey God. Now, to South Africa, I would just repeat what I said earlier. I am not recommending that we do or do not remove the embassy there. I am saying that the government has a far more complex problem to face them because we have an embassy, for example, in Managua right now where the San Sandinistas are in control. We have uh, an embassy in, in, in the Soviet Union, in Red China. We are talking about possibly beginning negotiations with Mr. Castro, and I'm not saying that's wrong or right. I'm simply saying that until we are willing to be totally consistent and take our embassy out of every place where human rights are being violated, we have no right to single out South Africa for, for, for a unilateral punishment. Reverend Farwell, I'm sorry, I think possibly I even misphrased the question that you right. misinterpreted. Somewhere in the along the way there was a miscommunication. To put the question more pointedly, do you feel that as a disciple of God that, you, that your criticism of Ronald Reagan or another government should be bound by the impracticalities of our, local, of our government? Or do you feel that you have an independent moral duty to speak out against evil wherever it exists? Oh, yes. I, I did misunderstand. And if you feel so, why haven't you spoken out against I, I think we do have the obligation, and I have spoken out. And, for example, when the Reagan government recommended the sale of AWACS to the Saudis, I not only spoke out against it with rabbis and Catholic priests, bought a full-page ad in the Washington Post on the day the Senate was voting, begging the Senate not to do it. I have opposed, uh, I opposed the appointment of uh, a, an ambassador to the Vatican on the basis that down the long haul we are setting a precedent that we, in my opinion, will regret when, for example, the Muslims ask for one in Mecca or the World Council of... I can just imagine so many problems down the long haul. I have spoken out on national television 
And I have no reservations about criticizing the Reagan government when I disagree with them, as they could well tell you. Thank you. Um, hypocrisy seems to be one of your themes tonight. As a Christian minister, I assume that you profess to love all humanity. Is there any way that you, in good faith, can justify your vindictive and uncharitable comment to the young lesbian woman who stood here a few moments ago? I didn't think anything I said was uncharitable. I think that we have a, we have a commitment. We have a commitment in Scripture to speak the truth in love. Uh, it, to me, to say that I do not feel that homosexuality is a perverted lifestyle would be speaking a mistruth. I believe that the Bible teaches clearly and often, if you're a minister, you know what the Bible says, that the homosexual lifestyle, God loves the homosexual, he loves the promiscuous heterosexual. God loves all of us, thank God for that. I, there's nothing, there's very little anybody in this room could have done that I haven't done twice, and I was raised an agnostic, and I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine why anybody would think that it's unloving for our Lord Jesus to condemn sin and love the sinner. That, is, that was his entire message when he came to this earth. He sat down with publicans and sinners, and the church condemned him for it. He went to those who needed a savior, who needed a spiritual physician. But he never one time condoned their lifestyle. He condemned their sin. He loved them as individuals. And to me, that is, is as common sense as believing John 3.16. Reverend Falwell, uh, respect your right to make uh, abortion the number one issue for yourself on your uh, government agenda personally. But how do you, um, how can you demand from others that they make that issue number one on their legislative agenda when, as you said earlier, and I, correctly I believe, that the, uh, there is no ideal candidate and that we have to balance competing issues and uh, right answers and wrong answers to determine the most qualified candidate? I'll give you a case in point. If there were two candidates running, both who were in favor of free choice, all right, that, that's a non-plus then as you look at your two candidates. Uh, let's suppose that uh, I'm the one who's voting now and I believe in a strong national defense, the president's Central American policy, and support for the state of Israel. Suppose this candidate also is strong on the Central American policy, supportive of the president. We finally get down to the Jewish question and he is, um, he is not pro-Israel. On that basis, I don't call this an ideal candidate by any means, and I wouldn't like to say lesser of two evils either. That's a bad uh, personification. But I would say this one candidate is closer to what I believe in than the other one and would get my vote. Okay, but what I, I think that, 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 that doesn't address the question. What about the candidate where there's a uh, difference between the two candidates on that particular issue, yet they, they differ in other, on I other issues so that on balance perhaps the candidate who is... Uh, pro-choice may support a number of uh, positions which may be uh, more just. Okay. Uh, give you an, an issue where I would, where they pretty well were equal all the way down the line. And uh, I couldn't honestly in my heart say I agree with any position of either candidate. I'll, I'll make an honest statement to you right now that you may not like, but in the case, for example, of Mr. Weicker and Mr. Moffitt, where I didn't agree with either one of them on anything, if I had been a Connecticut citizen, I would have voted for Lowell Weicker for President Reagan's majority seat. We're here. Uh, yes, Mr. Falwell, I'd like to say, first of all, that I applaud to some extent your making a uh, rape exception in your pro-life stand. However, I don't know whether you've given any thought to the procedural problems that that might raise. Um, as, as we know here, um, rape is a legal term and uh, not a medical one. And uh, does that mean that we need a court trial every time that a woman says she's raped wants an abortion? Does that mean that if she's raped by someone whom she can't identify or who disappears for nine months, she has to have the baby because there's no legal proof of rape, because there's been no trial to prove rape? What happens? There are no easy solutions when you're dealing with the civil rights of human beings. <laughs> there were none with the blacks. There were none with slavery 150 years ago. There is no easy, simplistic solution to the abortion issue. But if something is right, we decide if it must be done, then the rabbit can climb the tree whether he can or cannot. <laughs> just, just one note. I think we have about five minutes or so. Uh, so, unfortunately, that's about all the time.
Uh, Mr. Fogel, what, what uh, disturbs me really is that your uh, opposition always seems to be rather less vociferous than your proposition of given issues. And I don't think that any decent person would, for example, deprive you of the right to support a given candidate. But surely what is disturbing, however, is your reluctance as a churchman to criticise many of the most disturbing aspects of Reagan's policies. In other words, I think you, you mix your Christian values with your party political pragmatism. And I would particularly, as a European, cite the example of uh, President Reagan's very disturbing comments when, for example, he says that it's uh, possible to fight a limited strategic nuclear war in Europe. Admittedly, he said it wasn't two days later, but he said it was initially. Uh, when, for example, he, when, for example, at a time of huge international tension, he calls the, the second most powerful country in the world the focus of all evil, which hardly strikes me as a Christian or charitable gesture. And uh, I think it, it, it might be advantageous, Mr. Falwell, if you were to bear in mind the old Christian proverb, blessed are the peacemakers. When are you specifically going to criticize these most terrible, damaging aspects of Reagan's policies? When will you come out and say, I despise you for saying that it's a joke to bomb the Russians? I'm not going to come out and say to any human being, I despise you because I am a Christian. I, I love everybody. And I might, um, I might say, first of all, as a European, you should be very grateful that we have a president in Washington who, with Helmut Kohl in Germany and Margaret Thatcher in Great Britain, and now meet her on in England and so on, in Mr. France and so on, France. that we have, uh, we have committed ourselves in NATO uh, to the defense of the European continent so that you can come to America for education and go back to a free Europe one day. Jesus. Now, um, <laughs> and beyond that, uh, the president, as far as his statement X years ago on limited nuclear war and, and his rebuttal, I'm sure you'd allow the president one mistake. He's almost divine. <coughs> totally. M M Mr. Falwell, the trouble about having one mistake is if we live in a nuclear world, then that one mistake you might be the last mistake we ever make. Are you suggesting then that you've never made one? Are you suggesting, are you suggesting there could ever be a president who would sit in that office without human error? Of I'm suggesting, not. Mr. Falwell, that I'm not the president of the United States. And it's up to you. Fortunately. To, fortunately, indeed. Fortunately, indeed. It's up to all of us to, to measure our capabilities. And that's perhaps the trouble, trouble about this present president. He's too stupid to measure his capabilities. Well, I would... Uh, my, my answer to my European friend is that uh, if the president is stupid, that makes about 65% of the people in this country stupid. That's the majority he'll win by in 84. We will take one more question from each microphone, and then we're out of time. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Falwell, I have a good friend who is quite conservative, and he has a joke he likes to say. He says, Just one? <laughs> we got two now. <laughs> Who's, he likes to say, I'm a good conservative. I believe life begins at conception and ends at birth. Uh, I understand your objection to abortion. Uh, I don't agree with it. Um, Per se, but I, will, I ask you how you reconcile your love of human life with a strong defense stand that's based on nuclear weapons, which, by their nature, kill women, children, infants, unborn and otherwise, and which, by their nature, will end the human race if they're ever yes. used. I support the president's peace through strength initiative for one reason, because I do believe in peace and I do hate war and. And I believe that the president's position, not superiority, but parity with the Soviet Union, negotiating from a position of strength, is the best way to eventually, in a reasonable and fair, with impeccable inspection way, of building down not just the U.S. and Soviet uh, arsenals, but the other four, five, six nations that probably have the bomb as well. And we must, as Billy Graham said, one day look for that SALT-10, but in the process, I think there's 68, 67 years of record that the Soviets do not respond very well to weakness, as any Polish person could tell you, or Afghan, or whatever. The best way, as I can determine, that we can have a meeting in order here tonight with many varying opinions is because, obviously, this campus, as does our campus, this city, as does Lynchburg, has law enforcement officers. We all know that. Uh, the reason we can go to bed at night with reasonable sense of safety is because of that. And I was debating William Sloan Coffin once on this very issue. 
uh, his desire, like Ron Siders and others, and these are sincere persons, is that we should, uh, we should build down and expect the Soviets to reciprocate, trust their integrity. And Ron Sider said, if we happen to be wrong, we should meet them at the borders with flowers in one hand and God love you placards in the other as they're invading. Now, they, they may be right because the R Russians might laugh themselves to death. But the few, <laughs> the few who survived the laughter would line us up against the wall and shoot us. Now, all I'm saying is, I'm simply saying that the, because I love human life and I love my family, and, and want the next generation to grow up, grow up in the kind of freedom that allows a meeting like this one, which you cannot have in Havana or Peking or Moscow, is, 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 that would be strong enough to deter any such action. No, you never heard of anybody mugging Muhammad Ali. If you're strong enough that nobody's going to try something funny, I think it's reasonable to believe they won't. May, may I ask you one last quick question? Um, as a Christian, supposing that the unthinkable does happen, and the report comes in that missiles are coming over the poles in the hundreds of thousands. What would you want the president to do as a Christian? Would you want him to fire back? Well, first of all, as a Christian, I pray every day and every night that no such thing will ever happen. I believe we have that admonition in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to pray for, for all who are in authority, all nations, that we might live in peace and in that atmosphere of peace, preach the gospel of Christ to all men whom God would have all to be saved. That is, that is what I believe. Uh, you're asking me a question now, if they fired first and we were about to be annihilated, well, should we then, just to prove we could do it, and uh, say, let's make sure they're annihilated too? That is a question for which there is no answer. That is a question, may God forbid, that no president will ever have to answer. And I thank God that I am not the president, nor do I ever intend to be, not even dog catcher and uh, would ever put myself in that kind of a position. One question here. Uh, I'd like to address your uh, statement indicating that the United States was built on the sovereignty of God. Tell me, Mr. Fall, is this the same God who compelled the fleeing pilgrims and frontiersmen to massacre and to commit the genocide of the Native American people? And is this the same God which now compels misleaders like you to justify U.S.-supported massacres of the Salvadoran people? Tell me, Mr. Falwell, is this God in heaven or in hell? Well, may I say that the God you're speaking of the God you're speaking of not only instructed the founders to massacre Indians, he likewise did not lead them to import slaves. He likewise did not lead them to deny women the right to vote. He likewise did not in... Are you from India? That's right. From your country of India, instruct your government to go out and kill those poor religious people at the temple. God is not responsible for the evil actions of the people on this planet. God allows us as free moral beings to have a wonderful opportunity of free moral agency. When we choose to do wrong, it's because there are two agents in the world. And as a Christian minister, and I would imagine each Christian minister here would agree, we not only believe in a real and a true God, but a real and a true devil. And we believe that these two influences are at work in our society and that we cast the deciding vote as to who is going to win in our society. I, a long time ago, cast my vote in favor of the Lord Jesus Christ and I can only speak for myself that uh, God is against sin, he's against massacre. In El Salvador, he's against right-wing death squads and left-wing death squads and moderate death squads and all kinds of death squads. Tell, tell me, do you support the government of Duarte? I, I do not support any government. I support, uh, first of all, my God, and then I support, I'm in, a, in, in obedience to, in submission to my own government, as long as they do not ask me to disobey God. And I do support the right of the El, El Salvadoran people to elect their own president, which they did in a free election. With the Central Intelligence free Agency. democracy, help. elect their leader, which the Sandinistas have never allowed in Nicaragua. The Sandinistas... No, I, have to that I think we're done. I'm sorry. We're, at, we're really... We're done. Yeah. One more. The very last. Reverend Falwell, did I understand you to disassociate yourself from the uh, uh, death penalty for gays and lesbians? That, that oh, of course. About? No intelligent person on earth would I ever. I have heard other moral majority uh, uh, ministers. Well, uh, if you give me that, that, if you give me their names, sir, I'll publicly repudiate them, and I'll have them write you right. a letter and apologize. Right. Yes. Then my carry it one step further. What's the name, uh, sir? Are, are you? What are their names? You said you I, heard them. I, I, I'll, I'll see that you get them. 
Uh, <laughs> do you disassociate yourself then with violence against gays and lesbians? And if Absolutely. You do, not only against why, gays and lesbians. Then why do you not support anti-discrimination legislation at the local, state, and federal levels? Well, I'll tell you why I don't support, for example, uh, the gay rights bill, as it's commonly called, that's in the Congress right now. Uh, if you have read it carefully, you know that it, in essence, establishes the homosexual community as a bona fide minority status, like Hispanics or blacks. Yes. I personally feel that when you choose a promiscuous lifestyle, uh -huh. you should not be rewarded for it. D is I've it, never is it, met, is I've it, never it, met in my life, sir, a uh, former white or a former black or a former Hispanic. I have met many former homosexuals whom I've led to Christ who have come out of a perverted lifestyle, who are living moral lives and are contributing you, to society. You have talked about a lifestyle and about, a li about choice. Is it impossible for you to appreciate, realize the fact that for most lesbian and gay people, that is a question of God's given gift that is part of their nature and being. It is an orientation and is not a lifestyle. I lifestyle is how I dress, whether I'm a, 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 a conservative person in, in so many ways or, or a flamboyant sir. person. That's lifestyle. Sir, that while, I respect you, while I respect you, I totally disagree with the idea that we are born promiscuous. We are bro born with the right of that, choice. That is lifestyle. I'm talking about my basic nature as a lover of a person of the same sex, whether I'm lesbian or gay, that is the overwhelming experience of lesbian and gay people. Sir, have, you I not, have you not read the literature that backs up that position? We are not willful I don't children believe who are disobeying our way. God or our parents. And might I, might I further suggest that if you really believe that, I you really should, believe you it. should gather all, up all the men who are unfaithful to their wives and have them form an adult that's club. A, that's not... One is no, as no, ridiculous no. as the you other. Need, you need Good to talk time. to me about heterosexuals who are, who are living a lifestyle and not about their sexual orientation. Don't you see the difference? I feel it very possible to love every person, no matter how they live, wrong or right. I have no way, as a Christian who believes the Bible, of endorsing Have you read the literature that talks about sexual orientation yes, as, I a, have. as a basic book. nature? I've read the Word of God, the Bible, which presupposes I'm about, and I'm preempts talking about all faith. other literature. Right. And uh, being, as a Bible-believing Christian, I can't change my faith to fit the choices that you have. Have you read the, the, the uh, Catholic scholar MacNeil? Have you read... Uh, well, we have a few problems. Oswell, we are not uh, proud the Yale of Yale authority. But, um, but we authority. can't blame the Catholics. I know what the Pope would say about it right here if he was standing. He would say the well, same thing. Well, he needs some faith. education also. <laughs> I'm sorry we're out of time, but in fact, we really are out of time. I thank you all for joining us and hope to see you again.